it's well known that in history there's been a lot of people uh, that their stories have been lost and uh, be it in the Stone Age days uh, even finding Clovis points up this far north uh, they said they're not here but once in a while we find such pieces or some beautiful scrapers that they use to uh, uh, take the hides off a of buffalo and pipes uh, Native American pipes uh, at some of the fire pits that we find and those stories are just simply lost though because we still know so little about what was going on and when it was happening but today in McCook there are also stories that are going to be lost unless they are told and for example I have a combination of stories called uh, the whitest men in McCook now it's true that most of McCook is white but these two men were extra white and uh, it starts out with a, a construction man he came up to my candy truck he was real pale and I said what's wrong I said you just don't look good pale you know and he said well he had been uh, working at a construction site and his crane didn't uh, wasn't functioning right so he crawled clear to the top of it to fix it and he got clear up there and realized he had forgotten the tool that he needed to fix it with he said he's had the machine for 10 years and he had never forgot the tool before, but he did that day. Angry at the world and God and everybody, he crawls back down uh, the crane and goes over to pick up to get the tool. Just as he gets to the tool, uh, the uh, crane was struck by lightning. If he'd have been up in there, it would have more than likely killed him or injured him very, very badly. And he said that... Uh, he decided he'd worked enough that day and he was going to take the rest of the day off considering how close he came to being killed and that was my first white man story extra white if you will the second one was uh, a longtime uh, acquaintance of mine here in McCook he drove the Frito-Lay truck and he come pulling up and he said I'm taking a break he said uh, give me something cold and he was pale and I said, dear God, are you okay? And he said, well, he said, I just about killed some kids. And he was on B Street, he said, driving along. And he said, uh, the buildings come right up to the edge of B Street almost, really dangerous. And the alleys that go up there are shoot right into B Street. Well, he said, a bicycle comes shooting out of one of the alleys right across B Street, right in front of him. And he said, dear God, he locked on the brakes and burning rubber to get stopped. And he said that uh, he just missed uh, the kid getting ahead of him and off to the side, maybe a foot or two foot. And he said, just as he was slamming on the brakes, he said, here came the next kid that was going to hit inside. So he jumped off the brake and punched it, even though he said, and that kid was locking on the brakes and sliding his uh, bicycle. And as he went by, he said uh, he almost clipped the tire as the kid was sliding and he said if it had been a little bit further uh, the kid would have went under the tires and been crushed by the tires and he, he was just uh, he was just shaking yet and, and petrified from it and uh, he was extra white and I would tell those two stories but I need to also tell my own for I was coming home one day with my candy truck up on J Street and there was uh, a hedge that came to the edge of the road and on the other side was a driveway as I was driving along 20 miles an hour or so I never push it with the candy truck because it's loaded and uh, I'm, it's the end of the day I just want to get home it's no big deal but I'm driving about 20 miles an hour and out in front of uh, that hedge shot a kid on a tricycle right out in front of me and uh, I slammed on the brakes, burned a good six foot of black rubber, getting stopped. And as I got stopped, as I was on my snub nose van, candy van, you know, and I looked over the front of it as I'm uh, over the steering wheel, uh, and I could not see the kid. He was that close to my candy truck. And I hadn't heard the thump, but I thought my mind may not have allowed me to hear it. And I'm, t I'm just shaking. I, oh, my God, no, please. And that kid then rode out around into the uh, traffic uh, coming the other direction, and they had to lock on brakes, and then back up into his driveway. And I'm just sitting there shaking. And uh, the, uh, there was a cop down the street, luckily, that saw the whole thing. And uh, he pulled up there then, 
and I had uh, juices, my snow cone juices and gallon jugs, six of them, and all six had broke loose from their, their holding spots and had hit my front windshield. And it was that violent of a throw up to them. And uh, the uh, just coated candy and snow cone juices busted and juice sprayed everywhere. And uh, so he, he stopped and he said, I'll talk to him. He said, uh, you can file charges against them if you want for your damages. And I said, no. I said, I uh, probably lost $200. And I said, that's awful cheap compared to killing a kid. I don't know anybody that wouldn't pay $200 not to kill a kid. So I said, just forget it. And I said, uh, uh, it was just a terrifying experience. But I, and it couldn't have gotten any closer. It couldn't have gotten any closer. But I thank God. Uh, for my reflexes and for not going 25 that day, which was the speed limit. And so I was, I got home and walked in the door and my wife said, are you feeling okay? You're looking a little pale. <laughs> yeah, I was. And so those are three uh, stories of the whitest men in McCook. And I, maybe you know some too, but these stories will be lost if not told. And so always tell your stories. This is McCook's Mr. Bill. Thanks for listening.